the menu today. Let's see if we can turn this into, well, I won't spoil it for you. What happened to your ear? You're a mess. Oh, hello, Chip Dippers. Welcome to Retro Recipes. I hope you're doing well. That is to say, I hope you're doing better than this poor Commodore 64. You see, I found it on eBay and, well, it has a lot of issues. And by issues, I mean, what the hell even is that? Cobwebs? Now, many of you loved that extreme refurb of the Atari 800 XL. She didn't. But for this one, we're going to team up again with friend of the channel and legendary refurber, Pete, AKA. So we invite you to sit back Relax and enjoy this pictorial musical journey of bringing another of these special vintage machines back to life. Oh, and by the way, speaking of refurbs, unfortunately, Lady Fractic fell into a reupholstering machine recently. But don't worry, she's fully recovered. <laughs> I'll get my coat. Ahem, don't forget your hat. Welcome. Now, 1982's Commodore 64 remains the best-selling home computer of all time, having sold a reported 18 million units. And seen here is the 1986 redesign of that, the Commodore 64C. And it's one of those that I found on Fleabay. And the seller asked, Please save someone. So that's exactly what we're going to try to do. And here's how the unit was received. We've got everything from bits of decomposing paper to bits of cement to tire tracks. Uh, and unfortunately, things aren't any better around the sides either. It's hard to even imagine what this poor thing has been through. There is some good news. The warranty seal is still intact. Although looking inside it, those rusted screws are gonna be hard to remove. And yep, the case just snapped right off. But that does let us look inside and the amount of rust inside as well is just incredible. If you saw the video where I recovered data from the Titanic Amiga 4000, well, doesn't this look familiar? Now, as you saw, the seller said, working? Of course not. And they suggested someone might just want to use this for some spare keys. But could there be a chance that this could still work? Let's take a closer look. Yeah, it's nothing too bad, just a decade or two of dust and those weird cobwebby things again. <sighs> oh no, and the poor old Sid Chip. We'll save you, buddy. Yeah, I feel like there's actually some kind of civilization growing here. Speaking of Bender, as we start to disassemble things, we might be needing his services. So what about any screws that are just rusted on? Well, we can try the rather interestingly named Knocker Loose Plus Penetrating Solvent. <clears throat> uh, just spray it on liberally on all the screws. Let it soak in for a minute. And then if you're lucky, the screw will pop right off. And if you're not lucky, this will happen. Oh well. So let's use that same method 
until we get down to ground zero, where there's only one thing for it. Let's take the case to the spa and beat the devil out of it with the dish brush. But as it happened, the case itself wasn't hard to clean at all. Really, most of the problem dirt is on the keyboard. So this is how it turned out. But we do have some areas we need to fix, like these cracks in the ventilation shaft. What is this, Star Wars? Well, speaking of the force, we're going to need this to be stronger than just using acetone to bond the plastic together. So we take this brass mesh and wrap it around the inside of the case and then bond it in place by running the soldering iron across it to melt the plastic onto it. This makes a really sturdy framework for those fragile vents. And we just do a similar thing for any other cracked areas. Another problem you'll sometimes find is these stress fractures in the old plastic. They seem like they would be impossible to resolve, right? Wrong. What we do is heat up our heat gun to about 200 degrees centigrade and just run that hot air over the plastic and it will reform just enough to undo the stress fracture. also very stress relieving. Fragments like this can just be shaved off and even seemingly impossible things like a huge hole that once had a screw mount in it are actually quite simple. Just match the risers to where they used to go and use the soldering iron and in some cases a lot of glue to put everything back into place. And from motherboard risers to motherboard creators I recommend PCB Way. You should check out their new global Stand With PCB Wayers collaboration. You'll find the link in the description, because as we all know, PCB stands for Pete's Commodore Brilliance, doesn't it? Yes, I think it does. Here's another example. These clips are usually used to keep the top of the case locked into the base, and they're known for snapping off. And yes, you can 3D print new ones, but how about we get Bender back to just bend these pieces of wire into this staple shape and solder them in place. They're bound to provide a satisfying click when we snap the case back on at the end. And if we're completely missing a screw mount, well, we could get a raw plug instead, or as Lady Fractic might call it, an anchor. After all, they are designed to accept screws. Just put a generous amount of glue on, doesn't matter because we're never going to see this when the case is closed, it'll stay strong for another 30 years. Well, look at that. Good as new. Well, almost. But can we get the machine to actually work? Stay tuned. Well, let's see if we can answer that question of whether this will work by looking at the motherboard again. It never gets any easier to look at, does it? But let's focus our attention first on these rusted metals. And popping the top off the RF modulator reveals, well, a bit of a state rather than a little city. The metal is actually eaten away. There's not much better underneath either. Yuck. And with it desoldered, we can take a look at the circuitry inside and it is really shot. Look at those traces rusted away. But guess what? We've got another RF modulator in stock. But what about the other metals, like the cartridge slot and these keyboard risers? Well, let's drop them into a nice warm bath of phosphoric acid. Yeah, I don't recommend it for yourself, but it's really great for rust removal. It binds with the iron oxide, the rust, without damaging the metal itself. This really is our preferred method of removing rust from small parts. After 24 hours, the bubbling stops and the chemical reaction is over. But it's interesting to note that at the bottom left of the jar there, we had some screws and they've all dissolved. 
And what this means is those screws were pure iron oxide, pure rust by this point. And so the phosphoric acid removed all of them. That's okay, we've got some spares. So let's remove the plates from the acid and it's definitely eaten away a lot of that looser rust. We can still improve this. Let's grab our wire brush and scrub the devil out of them. And things are definitely looking a bit better now, but it's still quite tarnished. So let's get back to the knocker loose plus, spray that on it and give it some more scrubbing. Oh, we'll let it sit in this bowl for a bit and look at that. Good as new, well, you know, not bad. Now, as with any retro computer, it's a good idea to recap the board, remove the old capacitors, but particularly with these ones. So let's bring in our shiny brand new ones. Oh, and by the way, Pete sells recap kits, keyboard springs, and all kinds of great retro stuff at his store, retrohacks.net. Now the power switch was not in a good state, so let's remove it from the board. And actually a common problem with these is that the contacts get tarnished and stop making contact. So we can use contact cleaner to, you, know, you guessed it, clean the contacts and then resolder it back in place. Now our processor here isn't going to be doing much processing in this state. So let's get every PCB cleaning tool that we own, alcohol spray, anti-static brushes, and a toothbrush, and just go to work on this. It's going to take some time and time is marching on for this video, but here's how it looks when we're finished. Have you seen my toothbrush? No. Now we do want to remove the chips so we can check under them for any short circuits, but doing this is really tough. So we're going to have to use a ton of flux, solder wick, and our good old Hacko desoldering gun. And eventually the chips start to pop out. Told you. So let's clean up under all the chips and keep popping them out. Before long, we've cleaned and reinstated all the essential chips. So let's plug it into a monitor and see if this board might still work. Oh my gosh, it does. Kind of. <laughs> yeah, the text is a little bit blocky. Now the usual suspect is the character ROM. So let's desolder that along with the kernel just so that we can socket both of them and try again, this time with a diagnostic cartridge inserted. Still no good, and this is really weird because the only other suspect would be the PLA and we've already replaced that. Could it be the replacement itself was faulty? Let's replace the replacement. That is truly a beautiful picture, considering especially everything that this machine has been through. But we're not done yet, let's continue with the cleanup. Now as you saw earlier, the cartridge port's in a bit of a state. So with that desoldered and the board cleaned up underneath, it's clear there's still some oxidation on the pins. So we'll drop it in some hydrochloric acid for just a few minutes and, well, this speaks for itself, oxidation gone. So with that soldered back on board, we can apply this conformal coating, essentially a varnish, to the whole of the PCB, and that will help protect the newly restored traces. And we can put our new RF modulator and the cleaned up cartridge port metal back in place to complete the job. But not so fast, we've still got this keyboard to contend with. And flipping it over, we can see the candy floss spider has been visiting here as well. So let's brush that off and remove the screws. It's almost like uh, each of these keys provided an individual apartment for the candy floss spiders, but they've since moved out. So let's take the keyboard back to the spa and get scrubbing. And that stuff that we thought was green paper 
turns out to be old dried paint. And the nice thing about paint is if it's water soluble, it will dissolve in warm water. And that's what started to happen here. Certainly looking better. An interesting thing to note though, is that this yellowing under where the paint was tells us that the theory that actually darkness causes plastic to yellow more than light is a little bit proven here. After all, the paint was protecting these from the light and they still yellowed worse than the surrounding keys. We're popping the keys off and we can see these springs won't be able to be saved. But let's clean up the keyboard base and luckily we can spring into action with these new springs from retrohacks.net. As for the keys, into the hydrogen peroxide for the standard retro writing treatment. And while they're sitting in the sun, we can start to look at the keyboard membrane. Now on testing it, we noticed that some of the keys aren't actually working. And that's because these metal contact pads are not making contact. There's actually a simple fix for that. You can use a standard HB pencil and just draw it onto the pads. And the graphite in the so-called lead will restore the conductivity in theory. And after a few hours of retro writing, our new keys are ready. Before we can put this all back together, there's one thing left to cap this project off. The top of the case. And we'll just sand down the damage a little bit, not too much, so we don't affect the integrity of this already fragile and cracking case. Okay, you ready to see the finished product? Well first let's remind ourselves how bad things looked before. Thanks for watching, subscribe below and cheerio. Now, many of you love that.